This is Risky Women Radio, a show to connect, celebrate and champion women in risk, regulation and compliance. Sharing insight and perspective from the most influential members of our global Risky Women Network on the latest developments we need to think about, the challenges we should all talk more about and the innovation we are most excited about in governance, risk and compliance. Bringing together the hundreds of senior women professionals already connected with a new emerging group of leading women and men. I'm Kimberly Cole, your Chief Risky Woman. This episode is brought to you in partnership with My Compliance Office. With clients in over 80 countries and employees around the world, My Compliance Office is committed to delivering affordable, easy to use compliance technology. Thank you, My Compliance Office, for your support of Risky Women Radio. Welcome to Risky Women Radio. Today's Risky Woman is Kellyanne McHugh. For those who listened to my intro into Season 3, you will know that Kellyanne will be hosting some of the episodes for Risky Women Radio this season. Kellyanne is the Director of Asia Pacific for My Compliance Office based in Singapore. She's a passionate business leader focused on technology, risk and compliance. And today we are going to talk about conflicts of interest. Welcome, Kellyanne. Thanks, Kimberly. It's great to be here. Before we get stuck into conflicts of interest, can you tell us just a little bit more about My Compliance Office and what your business focus is? Yeah, absolutely. So My Compliance Office is a leading provider of conduct risk solutions. And in fact, we provide a global software as a service platform for managing conflicts of interest, gifts and entertainment, personal account dealing. And last year, we opened our office here in Singapore um, because we saw the need in this region to really um, address the market. So so that's sort of why I'm here, is, is to grow the business within APAC. So my compliance office recently conducted a survey, which I think will be of great interest to many of our risky women. So before handing over the reins to Kellyanne, I wanted to seek her expert opinion and hear the results of the my compliance office survey into the conflicts of interest. So before we get into that, what are some of the key discussions you're currently having with your customers? So our customers um, are global customers often, um, both in financial services sector and the corporate sector. And the conversations we have with our customers around conflicts of interest are anything from a simple challenge around personal account dealing compliance, paper-based processes, um, they're getting too many statements and confirms, particularly at this time with, with COVID, lots of people investing in the market or selling out of the market. And so they're really challenged by paper-based processes for that. Um, but equally other areas, so um, outside business activities or gifts and entertainment where they've had policies and procedures in place for a long time, but they may not actually have a systemized process for managing it. They don't understand where the trends are going in the gifts and entertainment space. Um, And that's what really led us to this particular survey was some customers asking us, well, what are you seeing in the market? Because you've implemented so many technology systems. What are you seeing in terms of the trends around rules and processes um, to mitigate risks from the extraterritoriality of the likes of UK Bribery Act and the FCPA? So that's sort of what led us to this gifts and entertainment report. Yes. So I think it's very, uh, very interesting. Um, Globally, regulators are asking organisations to review their corporate entertainment and gifts guidelines as as part of a lot of, you know, tougher governmental stances on anti-bribery and corruption. So it's uh, it's definitely topical. Can you tell us a little bit more about the uh, survey demographics and sort of the scope of the survey? Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of the survey itself, um, it was a reasonably equal split between the different regions. So 34% of our respondents were from APAC, 27% from Europe and the Middle East, and 39% from the United States. Um, So a reasonably even split. Um, 75% of the respondents were from um, financial services firms, 
with a large proportion of those being banks. Well, sorry, 34% were banks and then 23.5% were asset managers and fund managers, essentially. Um, And that's probably because a lot of our customers are in that space. Um, The rest were corporates. Um, I don't actually have the numbers of the the number of um, respondents at this point in time, but um, we'll certainly be running this again and, and hope to get... Uh, more results and more details as the years go on in terms of trends. Great. Um, So the survey was divided between gifts and entertainment and hospitality. Were there any surprises in the specific categories results that you would like to highlight? Yeah, there were a few different um, insights. So one area of compliance in this space is around entertainment. Um, So where you might be providing um, uh, taking a client out to an event, whether it's a sponsored event that you're hosting as a company or to an external event. Um, and I thought it was interesting that um, 22% roughly said it was up to manager discretion as to the cost or the fee that was associated with that entertainment. They hadn't actually set a limit um, for the amount that was paid, um, the dollar value against that event. Um, also said um, that that fee, when they did set a limit, was between $100 and $250, um, which seems reasonable. Um, But then most European companies actually limited entertainment to be be between $50 and $100. Um, So there's differing policies everywhere around the world. um, But I I did think that was interesting. Only 22% said you know, it was up to manager discretion in terms of entertainment. Go go large if you want to, if my manager says it's okay. <laughs> That's very interesting to see that variation. Um, do you think there is adequate focus on this area from most of the companies that you've been speaking to? Yeah, I mean, globally there has been over time. I think people may have become complacent about a gifts and entertainment policy and we're seeing some interest certainly globally in conflicts of interest anyway in the last 12 months the regulators have picked up on lax processes around the likes of personal account dealing the fca put out a watch on that um last year i think australia has done similar um to say that pro and actually the sfc did too processes and in place in these organizations were just too relaxed, probably too much paper and not enough systematic processes. But um, look, most companies have a policy and they provide training when employees are onboarded. Um, There seems to be a lack of ongoing training um, with real live examples of this. Um, We've seen some recent bribery and corruption cases in Asia, um, which demonstrate that training is not strong enough in this space and um, around what's right and what's wrong when dealing with, you know, politically exposed persons that you might be entertaining to win a deal. So I think there is some room for improvement here. Um, what was also interesting is particularly with this dollar limits approach and the various and various different responses we got, the only real rules, at least that I know of, that are specific in this space is almost like the US broker dealer rules where they're very specific about um, de minimis values and how, you know, when you have to declare a gift, whereas everywhere else in the world, it's a little bit vague. um, And it's really about the organization setting a policy about, well, if you give or receive this gift, is it likely that you're going to have to have a future commitment to that client you know, are you promising something in return for that gift that you're giving um, or receiving? So there is some improvement to take. Um, I think just to carry on on that a little bit here in Asia, there is a focus on gifts and entertainment because we have so many religious um, sort of holidays um, to celebrate throughout the year. So gifts and entertainment policies in Asia have to be specific around um you know, gifting periods like the Lunar, U- Lunar New Year, um, um, Diwali, etc. There's there's obviously rules and policies and organisations have to put in place for that. So that's interesting. Um, what are some of the results or the 
the sort of best practices, I guess, more um, that you're seeing that companies are putting in place around gifts and entertainment? Yeah, so I've got sort of five um, best practices. Um, One, policies should have clear dollar limits for giving and receiving gifts and entertainment. And the emphasis there on both gifts and entertainment, I think the more specific you are, the easier it's going to be for an employee to comply. Number two, um, have detailed examples of what is considered a gift versus entertainment and what is allowed and not allowed in your policy. Be specific about it. Number three, uh, define a policy for your approval process, um, but not just approvals in general, for pre-approval. A number of organisations, in fact, 65% of the organisations in our survey said that they did require pre-clearance processes for giving or receiving gifts and entertainment. Number four, um, ensure the policy matches your industry and region. So do describe risk events that have occurred in the past and what would constitute a conflict in your organisation, like the example I mentioned around Lunar New Year, Christmas, Diwali, gift giving. What is the dollar value you're allowed to give or receive? Um, And number five, um, of course, implement a technology system so compliance can easily monitor, approve and review and record uh, and record. And, you know, there's many enforcement cases, surveillance that um, regulators are doing. The more you can easily demonstrate what your individuals and organization have been giving or receiving, uh, the better. That's great. Uh very clear, easy to follow, top five uh, tips for all of the rescue women who are listening. So what should companies consider implementing to assist their conflicts of interest program? Yeah, so from a conflicts of interest perspective, you need to obviously have the policy defined in the first place. Um, And following that policy, you do need to train and educate your staff on what that policy means. And, And not just once when they onboard, but regularly. When there is a scenario that's occurred in the market um, that might be related to your industry, re-educate them with, you know, a 10-minute training session as to what that might mean if they were to do that in their organization. And number three, implement technology to make it easy for your employees to actually declare that they've given or received a gift. Um, The MCO platform allows you to do your pre-clearance process. Um, record the actual gift that you gave or received um, and then report on that as an organisation. It it means that from a compliance officer's perspective, you're not manually receiving an email or a document or reviewing an expense report. You can actually have that automated um, completely, which which is useful from a reporting perspective. So that, that would be my few tips. Yeah, so I was going to ask about, you know, how technology was um, assisting. Uh, so that's, that's you know, really interesting. And obviously through my compliance office, there's, a, there's an excellent, um, you know, workflow tool that companies can use. Um, and what are the changes that you've seen over time? How is the industry evolving and how is technology really starting to, you know, play a part? Yeah, I mean, so traditionally in this space, um even if I think back to um, some of my previous employers, we it was manual or it was just a policy. There was not really this approach of actually declaring the gift or the entertainment received. You might tell your manager, but they go, meh, it's okay. Um, whereas when you put a policy and a, and a technology in place, you can actually um, see the compliance occurring. Um, So technology for gifts and entertainment perspective, um, our system allows you to do a pre-clearance and to either automatically approve or deny that um, request based on your policy. So even, you know, in in a paper-based system, um, entering a $30 gift might be painful because somebody has to review that and it definitely is most likely not going to cause a conflict. But if you allow, you have a technology system, you can enter that $30 um, gift or entertainment. It's in the system. It's recorded. It can be found later on. And that's important from a record-keeping perspective. But it doesn't cause any pain on the compliance officer because it was automatically approved. 
So our technology can help to, to take that burden off an administrative officer, HR or compliance when it comes to Gibson Entertainment. Well, it sounds like there was a lot of interesting points that you've really managed to uncover and, and perhaps dig into and, and identify some you know, best practice for the industry. So this is going to be an annual survey now, is it? Yeah, we hope so. Absolutely. So this was just the beginning. We're just, um, you know, our very first survey and um, we're happy to see the results. And we, I think we will absolutely do this again. Um, it's good to see where trends are going in the in this space. Absolutely. And for anyone who would like to see the full survey report, or you can go to the My Compliance Office website. We'll also put the details here in the show notes of Risky Women Radio. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. And please stay tuned for the uh, upcoming episodes where you will enjoy hearing Kellyanne on the other side of the microphone. And she is going to be speaking to some other fabulous uh, Risky Women. So uh, definitely uh, stay tuned for the rest of Season 3 and enjoy. Thank you so much for listening to us. No, absolutely. Very much so looking forward to it. Thanks, Kimberly. Thank you for listening. And please go to the My Compliance Office uh, website and download the survey to get the full results. Thank you for listening to this exciting episode of Rescue Women Radio to connect, champion and celebrate women in risk regulation and compliance. I'm Kimberly Cole, based in Hong Kong. For more information on the Risky Women Global Network, head to our website in the episode notes and please be a part of the ongoing conversation by subscribing to this podcast, connecting with us at Risky Women on Twitter, or even reaching out to me directly by email.